This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I want to thank the organizers that they're in the, the other panel, but anyway, and, and Joanna for, for chairing this session. Um, according to the Italian Jesu Macerici, who arrived in China in 1583, the uniqueness of China resided in the key role that letters play in the kingdom. Ricci said, I quote, if philosophers are not kings, it is true that kings are governed by philosophers, end of quote. Many of these philosophers were those who succeeded in the, in the civil service examination um, and obtained official posts within the empire. This examination system was designed to test the merits of young men most of whom came from literati or merchant backgrounds. For those without photographic memory, instruction in mnemonic skills uh, was part of the classical teaching repertoire in Imperial China. When learning about this training, Matteo Ricci composed his Tipo Tifa, or the Occidental Method of Memory of 1596, his second work in Chinese that fed on Ricci's cultural background um, to, a greater, to a great extent. The Western art of memory, at its core, was uh, an aid to rhetoric, a technique with which an, a narrator could improve his memory, thus enabling him to deliver long speeches with unfailing accuracy. The classical sources, like the treatise on rhetoric ad herenium, among others, established the distinction between two kinds of memory, uh, one natural, the other artificial. The natural memory is engrafted in our minds, and born simultaneously with thought. Um, the, art the artificial memory uh, instead is, is a memory strengthened or confirmed by training. The artificial memory is established from places and images. <coughs> Regarding the places, the commons, though the, not the only uh, type of mnemonic system uh, used was the architectural type. This one is the one that Ricci exported to China. Uh, through his treatise, the Shibo Chifa, as I will show later. In early modern Europe, the members of the Society of Jesus soon attracted the cultural elite and their male offspring to study in their schools. And they also provided space for the study of rhetoric. The Arte Retorica by the Portuguese humanist Cipriano Soares uh, was used in the Jesuit colleges in Europe and included uh, lessons for enhancing artificial memory. Mm, this uh, work by Suarez would be like a textbook, would be like a, a mishmash of, of Cicero and Quintilian, basically. Um, as I already mentioned, once in China, Ricci taught the Chinese the most usual mnemonic based system according to Western tradition, which was a, the architectural type. My paper examines the multi misunderstandings that stem from different ways, Chinese and Western to conceive and deploy memory in the production of images. Being images a means to visualize memory. The question here is how translatable an image understood as a means to visualize memory, how, how, trans, how translatable can be? And I am to analyze this question for which is a chief or chief in China. So I will start by placing which treaties in the context of the China mission. Soon after his arrival in China in 1583, in his correspondence with Europe, Matteo Ricci described the three sects, as he would call them, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, always presenting them as three water, water type categories. Ricci always distinguished Confucianism from the other two, uh, for in his view, it was not idolatrous. The non idolatrous gentility Ricci implicitly ascribes to the Confucians was also a response to his idea of Confucianism as a moral system that served to govern the empire wisely, but was lacking in metaphysical or supernatural foundations. This is the basis of the synthesis which he constructed between Christianity and Confucianism as simply put, they were, in his eyes, compatible at a moral and ethical level. And Christianity would provide Confucianism with a supernatural base. Ricci's interpretation uh, was the result of, of his study of the, uh, the Confucian 
for books, the Sushu, towards the end of the 1580s, which he then translated into Latin. They were all basic books in the education of scholars trained to hold imperial posts. Um, those scholars to whom he dedicated the Deshi Portifa. Together with the four books, the five classics form a compendium that was the cornerstone of Confucian education. Richard regarded Confucius the sage as another Seneca, un altro Seneca, he would say, and the four books as good moral works. These perceptions serve as an impulse for the Jesuit to compose humanistic writings proclaiming wisdom from the West, and such is the case of his treatise, the Shikwa Chifa. In a letter to the General of the Society of Jesus, Claudio Aquaviva, um, a letter uh, he wrote in Nanchan in 1595, Richie says that he started to teach the memory of places, the memoria locale, who would say it's native Italian, to some of his visitors. Indeed, when it became known that Matteo Ricci had a prodigious memory and that he had mastered a Western art of memory based on remembering the order of things, the Jesuit received invitations to present his art to the literary world of the Lemmy period. For instance, the governor of the Jiangxi province invited Ricci to teach his memory enhancing techniques to his three sons, then preparing for the civil examinations. Um, according to Ricci, uh, the Chinese soon learned that he himself knew an art of memory. And Ricci said that it was something unprecedented for them. And being a city full of students and literati, there could not be anything more welcome than this. But the composition of, of the Shikwa Chief also responded to Ricci's awareness of the importance and power of the written word in China, of which he made good use. Uh, as he himself said, books could get to the places the Jesuits could not reach. Let us now analyze briefly the treatise itself, the Shikwa Chifa. Uh, this is a six chapter treatise. In the first chapter, Rich introduces his method by referring to human memory as a storehouse in which men can store what they remember, uh, ready to be used whenever they want. His method is about storing knowledge. It's not just about remembering. Uh, this is something he stresses in the first chapter, that uh, storage requires a method. And he uses the, the Chinese term chifa, which was not exactly uh, a good choice in Chinese, because chifa uh, for a Chinese would be more proper maybe to think of a xinfa. Xinfa implies a mental process. So chifa was not really something that what a Chinese would find clear as, um, as a translation. The second chapter relates how this art of memoria locale, or the memory places, was born. And here which reproduces Cicero's De Oratore, and the story of how this method, this method was created. It's a very brief translation of part of, of, of Cicero's um, De Oratore. From the third chapter on, Richie introduces the details of his memory method through images. It is a method based on images. And he, in this same chapter, he explains that there are different sizes of architectural uh, structures in which to place the images in an orderly fashion. And, and here he starts to provide very specific rules. I think he's following more quintillion here in the sense that the, the, the rules are, are more specific than in Cicero's. Um, so he, he goes into details if they are abstract, if the images are abstract or, or, or about concrete things. Uh, and, and then it's important to consider the quality, their brightness, just to name a few, a few aspects that, um, that he, he explains in this third chapter. The fourth chapter delves into the history of Chinese characters, and I think this is the here's when we start to find the, the, the what I said the misunderstandings or the or the failure to translate images because this is not an aspect that I, I, I found so far has been analyzed uh, in these treaties, and I think it's it's a key aspect to to understand why it was very uh, the reception was kind kind of, of poor. Uh, because Ricci chooses 
Chinese characters as ideal images to be placed in this memory palace. So he narrates or he explains the theory of the formation of characters. Um, the different, he explains the different kinds of Chinese characters that actually are very are, are, were described in an ancient work entitled The Origin of Chinese Characters, the Shuo Wen Jie Si, a source that he doesn't mention, but it's very clear that his, his, uh, his explanation is, is uh, a very, very classical explanation taken from, from this very well known source. Um, so, this, the fourth chapter is full of, of examples of the different categories of Chinese characters. And the last two chapters are about more and more examples. It's just about examples of all the different possibilities for creating Chinese characters slash images. So, at this point we may ask, why Ricci was explaining the main structures of the Chinese written characters to the Chinese? Uh, because Ricci saw much potential to, to use the Chinese characters as images that stand for the things to be memorized, to be placed in the storehouse, a memory place or whatever the structure in an orderly fashion. Consequently, when introducing the different categories of Chinese characters and analyzing their forms and structure, which is actually explaining how different images can be made. What Ricci captures is that each Chinese character is an integrated visual structure of lines or strokes expressing a single image or concept. In this direction, we might remember the author of uh, the, the treatise I already mentioned, the Ad Perineum, who stated that the duty of an instructor in mnemonics is to teach the method of making images, give a few examples, and then encourage the student to form his own. However, it's a rich choice of, of using the Chinese characters as ideal images for a memory palace where we find a reason, or one of the reasons, for which is to um, scarce, uh, scarce success among the Chinese literati. Um, one of the scholars who analyzed this treatise and actually translated it into German, uh, Michael Lagner, stressed the difference between alphabetic and non-alphabetic writing. In this respect, what Lagner says is that the Chinese character allows for a more direct act access to what is meant, the signifying, than in alphabetic writing systems which need a roundabout, a roundabout way to the signifying. And I think that the difference between languages is, 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 a, is a key element here. And this is a, some question, but I add and pose the following questions uh, to further this, this distinction. Uh, first, how the Chinese characters as images could become central elements to communicate meaning and narrative to the Chinese. And second, do the Chinese characters represent knowledge, and more specifically, knowledge to be stored and access wherever needed? Uh, or maybe it was necessary to resort to a, a supra-linguistic way of presenting knowledge to render this method useful to the local readership. This is work in progress, so I, I'm just working on, on these questions and, and, and trying to, to, I'm still trying to find some answers um, but the thing is that uh, when, I, when I, I, I just I just pose these questions that if if Ritchie had taken into account these aspects, that would have required the knowledge of local mnemonic techniques, and Ritchie seemed to ignore the different Chinese mnemonic techniques and how they worked, or at least he doesn't he doesn't mention any of them. In all his works, I haven't found one reference to uh, local, local mnemonic techniques. So we find the use of diagrams, the, the two, for mnemonic purposes, was a rather common phenomenon in China. During the Song Dynasty, and especially in the Neo-Confucian tradition, this is from, from uh, the 10th to the 13th century, diagrams could be a visual support for textual analysis. The diagram was meant to give an analytical overview of the structure of a text 
and was also a visual aid for memorizing the text. But diaries could have different, really different uses uh, for it. Uh, could encode technical knowledge, could be used to uh, visually analyze a topic into its parts and subparts, or they could be used for logical demonstration. Um, in this regard, the popularization of woodblock, uh, woodblock printing had opened up a new opportunities for writers of different subjects such as uh, cosmology, mathematics, medicine, building, among others, um, developing richer forms of communication through the use of diagrams, charts, and, and illustrations. But the thing is that Ritchie did not include a text for which images could act as a visual aid for its memorization. There's no text. And here we may encounter a major reason to explain the very limited impact of Ritchie's treatise, at least as a tool and aid for the Chinese candidates when preparing for the civil service examinations. Um, the, the treatise uh, misses uh, Ritchie is missing a key element present in China. Uh, this is the relation between image and text. So Ritchie's method did not, did not offer a text as an anchorage uh, to images. I think that maybe rendering too abstract as a method to recall a classical text. Uh, regarding the specific training for the civil service examinations, rote memorization played a key role. A written tradition of composition was rehearsed orally by candidates to recall the, classi the classical text verbatim. For those without photographic memory, instruction in mnemonic skills was part of the classical teaching repertoire in Imperial China, as I mentioned, where oral recitation was aided by, there were different techniques, rhyming characters, four character jingles, and the technique of writing an antithetical pairs of characters, the, 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 the technique called uh, Shu Tui. Regarding the latter, Many educators in the main period made the memorization of these two character phrases a major building block of a classical manner. To conclude, these are all aspects that attempt to explain why the images that Richie chose for his method, his chifa in Chinese, were untranslatable. He wanted to provide the Chinese literati who, who were preparing themselves for the civil service examinations with a method to remember the cryptic passages of the Chinese classics. But they had different techniques to that end, being wrote memorization at the core of this training. Of this training. When, he, when reading the Chico Chifa, uh, one can tell that Richie clearly focused on one of the main aspects of the Western art of memory, which is the, the way it, con it constructs it images in internal mental spaces and he chose the Chinese characters to that end. Ritchie's Chico Chifa was an attempt to seduce the Chinese literati by helping them to remember their sacred text for a Western method. method sorry. However, it was a Western method that focused on aspects of the Chinese language that might not have been useful for the Chinese themselves. What is more, as a, as a method with a, a Western core, I think that by focusing focusing on the Chinese characters as ideal images for a memory palace, Ritchie missed a crucial point uh, in the Western tradition, which is the dense network of relationships that connect spaces and images. And this is an aspect that he does not thoroughly elaborate uh, in his treatise. Thank you very much. So does anybody have any point of clarification before we open uh, the discussion to uh, more broadly to Anna Karolina? Yes. Just to be sure, um, so the memory technique that Richard tried to translate involves these memory palaces, right? This yeah. Space room. And did I understand right that he also didn't include a picture of one of them, he didn't visualize this technique? Yeah, it's not, uh, you mean if there are diagrams or, or trees or, yes. no, 
or a picture yeah. of such a room or bathroom that you mentally store your there are no no doubt. It also means a very no, it's a uh, practical book tenor. It's uh, really, I mean, it's uh, what, what you find is is the, the, the actually it's, it's it's not really a nice piece to I mean for for a PowerPoint because it's all text and what you see is that the characters are uh, he's explaining how to how to make characters so if it, it's uh, I think that it's it was really an appealing. So how do you explain it? seems like he's explaining the things they already know. And he's well, forgetting to explain what they should learn. Yeah, actually that's why it was the least successful uh, of, 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 yeah, of his writings. Because there were no reprints. That's how you can tell that. I mean, there, there were no later editions. Um, and the idea is, and actually this is something I, Michael Lagner, the specialist, I, is, I think is the first one who really started to, to analyze what, what's going on with these treaties because people think that it's so wonderful to translate Cicero and Quintilia into, I mean, and it's, it's really hard work, but the thing is that even if you consider the, the way he translates Cicero and Quintilia, it's kind of superficial. It's the very, very basic of, 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 of the contents of, of both, you know, uh, authors. So um, I was uh, I, I I lost what I was saying. I was talking about Michael, Michael Lerner and and the and the poor success. Of, well, the the absence of diagrams is one of the is is one of the major points to understand the. Can you you have an idea how he could be so stupid, so to speak, an exception? Or, or no, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's what a he, question we may no. ask many historical. <laughs> no, well, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I mentioned Michael Wagner because he says I thought something is completely true. I mean, it makes sense for a Western studying Chinese. If you want to study Chinese, well, that, that the treaties may, yeah, but for, for the Chinese, trying to remember very cryptic passages of the Book of Changes doesn't make any sense. Could I just yeah. ask that, about that? So, I mean, is he actually saying it? Because what I, I think I found, I didn't understand quite, was what you meant by images. I mean, you, 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 you stressed, you know, the word images very much. But is that different from the picture in, in your analysis? I mean, does it, I mean, so in a memory theatre, as I yeah. understand it, an image refers to the thing to be remembered. That's right. Okay. And you're saying that the Chinese characters, therefore, would be used as, um, you, you talked about them in part as having some kind of um, um, hieroglyph, almost hieroglyphic kind of character, so that they, 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 they sort of refer, they have some the pictographic kind of character. Yeah, well, yeah. But yeah. beyond that, are you suggesting that Ricci is uh, wanting them to be used to remember text? So not having just that. No, the problem is that it's the problem is that the, the treatise does not offer um, there's if you read the treatise, I mean it's based on images. This is something Richie says. I don't understand it's based on images, the images are the Chinese characters. They say we can place the the, the, the uh, a certain character. He analyzes the radical, he analyzes uh, the, the other part after the, the radical. But the problem is that there's no way you can apply that for Chinese. So he displays the characters, and he focuses on how to make images, how to make Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that there's no way to imagine how to apply that. It's too abstract. So that's why the Chinese found was really complicated. And actually, when I was in China analyzing these treaties, mm -hmm. They say this is really unnecessarily complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing is that um, there's no uh, there's no way you can imagine how how to apply the method. Mm -hmm. But for images, it's all about Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. It's the image is the image is the Chinese character. It's there, there's no other. Mm -hmm. But can I, can I jump in there? Is that not related? Isn't he seduced by the idea that Chinese characters are pictograms? Uh, well, yes. Yeah. And, and, 
because of the essential work. Also, uh, ideograms in that they, they, they encapsulate ideas too. So yes, concepts. Yeah, concepts. So that's why I'm saying this word images, because the images within within a, a memory theatre are concepts or pictograms, or yes. they're working in all sorts of different ways. They're not just visual, as it were, simple. Yes. Yeah. But then I think that you have the, I mean, this distinction of non-alphabetic writings yeah. and, 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 and how, I mean, the, the, the way to what, what is represented, yeah. it's, it's direct, which is not the same, then it's not the case in the alphabetic writing and the images placed in, the, in this memory analysis that you may, that you may find. So the problem, what, you, what I think we are analyzing actually in Heidelberg with all the people working on diagrams and other kind of images is what's the value of an image by itself? What does it represent a Chinese character to a Chinese? Of course there's a concept there, but uh, the problem is that how, how much knowledge is, is encoded there if you want to uh, use that image to access knowledge or to store it, because it's your language. So it might, be, I think it's, again, it, it's, very, it's very difficult because it's, it's uh, we're dealing with the, with, with the, with the, the different uh, writing systems, but it's a problem we're analyzing because still, um, it's a problem that you find with other visual aids in China, in China so not in China, so that's what, what I do. But, um, the thing is for a Chinese, how much knowledge or uh, the, 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 how, how, how dense a, con a concept can be, mm -hmm. can be encoded in a Chinese character. Yeah. This is the problem. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are no. I'm resorting to other authors working on alternative writing systems, and not not in China. Mm -hmm. I found very interesting works with people doing uh, uh, post-colonial studies and, and other kind of analysis. I want to try to join the pigs together. I'm racking my brains here <laughs> in some ways. But if anybody's got a question that they can kind of think of in a way about the two or, or, or I just want to ask a very short yeah. questions concerning this Hebo uh, Ziva. It sounds a little bit to me like as if Matteo Ricci didn't write um, this book for a Chinese audience but for a Western audience to mm -hmm. teach them the Chinese writing system, but then he shouldn't have written it in Chinese, right? I mean, it makes no sense. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. So, but, yeah, I mean, um, it sounds as if the Chinese couldn't use it because they already knew how the Chinese writing system works, and the um, Western audience couldn't read it because it's written in Chinese. So, I mean, I'm just wondering uh, who, yeah, who but would actually need. No, I think that this is the thing. I mean, it would be useful for 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 Western for Westerners, but mm. I think that I think that Richie's intention is that his second treat. I mean, his second work in Chinese, and mm. I think that what he says is that this is a very sophisticated. He says to the Chinese, "This is in the in the introduction." Yeah, yeah. He says, yeah. "This is a very well discussed matter in the West." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and there's a, this, this has a very long tradition, so he's trying to impress the literati, and I think that it's a clumsy attempt, because it's a second work. Mm -hmm. The first one is a treatise on friendship, yeah. which again, is a translation of Cicero and Aristotle, all maxims uh, on friendship, but the problem is that it's a treatise that, I mean, as a treatise on friendship, it doesn't have to be useful, and a method, a um, mnemonic, you know, a, a, a method, you know, a, a mnemonic method has to be useful. Yeah. So I think this is what what he's missing. He he still wants to impress them by showing this this architectural type mm -hmm. and the images to be placed there, and by translating this sort of very short, you know, passages of Cicero and Quintilian. But I think that he is very impressed by the 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 the, the, the um, the Chinese characters as I mean, concepts, but the problem is that he he doesn't know the, their local techniques. He doesn't know how they how they want to how they I mean their tools to remember. So 
he ignores those techniques. So then he he resorts to what it's appealing to him. Yes. There was a question before yours. Yes. Little question about the number of religious cases, and I hope it's not going to be so confused as I'm still thinking about that. He said, considering previously two things which are happening in Europe, roughly the budget is just rising, and that in the first place, <coughs> that hieroglyphs and ideograms yeah. do start having that sort of appeal to the original language and to, to, mm -hmm. to, to reality rather than just to, to language or to the universal language itself and think about Kircher or Wilkins, the essay was real character. And thinking also about the fact that out of memory, exactly in those years, and for instance Bruno, is starting to have a metaphysical appeal and not just a rhetorical appeal, and particularly as it sprouts from the Logan tradition, then what you're describing would in fact be sort of perfect situation from the European point of view. So you can write a treatise, a sort of Albertus Magnus like treatise, and say you visualize a church, or maybe not a church, but because we're thinking about China, and say you have a series of ten columns, and where Alberto Magnus would say, well, for each of those columns you think about an image, then you can just think about an ideogram, a, a character, or a, 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 of course this is hugely different from, for instance, even when we think about asking the money of a bomb, then you, you have to memorize the foreign words and you split it into all the letters and you associate uh, an image to each letter. So if that was Bruno, for instance, you have to memorize any word and you have, you can visualize, I don't know, Hector dressed in red with something else and something close to it, riding a horse and put all together the bigger words that you have to remember. But in your case, and this, of course, is a bit weird from the mnemonic point of view. You are, in fact, trying to memorize something through the exact thing you are going to memorize. <laughs> <laughs> you have to memorize that's that's word. That's 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 and in order to memorize that word, you use the word which you need to memorize because that word is an image. Which is weird, yeah. Yeah. Strictly, logically speaking. But it is not weird at all if you think about it from the ontologic or metaphysic point of view, that's the utmost result of the ontologic as mnemonic. So what I'm wondering, and I'm sorry about that, I've been talking for two minutes about that, is that any, any, anything that Richie says, that, that Richie tries to export into China about the metaphysics, the ontologic use of the as mnemonic? Well, I think that no, because in the Roman college, he was educated, and then he went to India in the early 1570s. So what we have is that an education where rhetoric is the main goal. And they have this textbook that I mentioned, Suarez. Suarez, I, actually I, 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 I consulted this book at the, at the Jesuit archives in Rome, which is like a textbook. You can see that, as I said, it's like a mishmash of Cicero and Matilda, basically. That's what we have. And, and what is happening in Europe is that you find this, this very versatile man with these very sophisticated methods. But Ritchie, he does not have the chance, I would say, to really be knowledgeable of, of those methods. It's but all based on rhetoric. As a Jesuit, he most probably knew know and will was all about this, basically. I think yeah, that uh, from the mnemonic principle. Well, but uh, I mean, if you read the, the letters and, and his uh, account uh, on the Jesuit <coughs> mission in China, he mentions rhetoric as, as the main as the main goal, and the offers his his quoting are all you know it's based on rhetoric. But what he says is in China, rhetoric is not oral; it's all about the written word. So I think that's why he is really interested in, in, in composing these these treaties. But I cannot. Okay, I, I, I could can I just because I'm conscious of your time, and I, yeah. I would like a discussion that actually involves uh, both yeah, yeah, both yeah. people. Oh, um, one, I mean, Sashiko, is your your question uh, um, one that could encompass both people? Um, could you try? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I actually have. Well, I will try. Or a question. Okay. Or a question. So, 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 so my, my question really was. 
um, the one I had was for Claire, yeah. and actually the, the, way, the way in which sort of, so there are these hierarchies of tra translators and, and um, scribes and so on, um, synthesizing knowledge, written, moral, and so on, in a kind of basically state machine, bureaucracy, regarding medical knowledge. What does that say about the state's interest in medical knowledge? And I guess the counterpart question to Anna Carolina would have been, what does Richie, what might Richie exemplify as, if like, the, his institution would be the Jesuits, so it would be the kind of Jesuits' um, interest in local knowledge. They're not quite yeah, symmetric, yeah, but that's yeah, 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 yeah. There is a connection, yeah. Yeah, so kind of institutions and their purposes yeah, yeah, in yes. bringing knowledge. The Russians are very kind of almost utilitarian in their attitude to knowledge, and they're very interested in, in kind of very broadly speaking, artisanal knowledge, practical knowledge. So the other kind of experts they bring across are people like miners and military experts. It's very, all of these reports, I'm just taking one kind of section, they actually come in with these scrolls and we have the order to translate and then the knowledge and then the resolution of the affair and it's things like um, danger of plague, deaths of important people, um, what other kinds of things, witchcraft trials, um, western medical knowledge gets folded into that and concerns about use of dangerous herbs in witchcraft. It's all very, very practical. We had a fitness report, I think, I included in there, and they have this wonderful, the fitness reports come with these series of questions of, are they sick, can we fix them, can they serve the czar? So it's always very specifically directed, we're taking, it's, it's about the czar, can we call the czar in some way? Um, they're taking this knowledge and they're saying, what, what can we take from this that helps us in some way? There doesn't, in, in the state machinery, there doesn't seem to be a particular interest in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Mm -hmm. There is an interest in knowledge that will get us somewhere, that will do something for us. It's very, very kind of goal orientated. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I want to make sure that I understood the question is what the Jesuit interest in transmitting this kind of, this, this knowledge. Another way of asking it is, it is something like within an institutional framework, what is what is being translated? What you know? What is the thing that's being translated? So Claire was talking about you know practical know-how that that has a particular pragmatic purpose, and it and that relates to your question as well about um, you know it, it, is it practical? That, well, I, I and, think and, and, and what are the Jesuits in a sense? Why are they supporting this? And and how does it fit in within if you like a wider Jesuit? mission okay. in China. I, okay, it was supposed to be practical, but it was not. So this was... Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it actually says that. that. It says... It, well, he's not to going to say that in letters, because they need money. No, I mean, in, in the purpose of the book, it might say it in the preface to the book or something. It says, this is for the civil servants who want to change. <coughs> oh, yes, yes. yes. The thing is that, the, the, the thing is that the, the, the ship or chief makes sense when you think that, I mean, it's political, and this is something very important. The Jesuits would stay there if the emperor and the philosophers, as you would call them, the, the, you know, the, 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 the scholar officials, uh, if they let them stay or not. Mm -hmm. This is not a colonial context where the Jesuits mm -hmm. could be, you know, there because Philip II just, you know, sent them there. So it is. So you could you could argue that that, that uh, you could uh, absolutely say, well, look, um, by providing you with something useful that's helping you to pass your exams, etc. But you could also say that if we can make ourselves seem so prestigious and, and yes. be so this is wisdom from, wisdom from the West. Uh, yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. This, this is yeah. I mentioned. I, I mentioned this earlier. Right? This, this has been a, an issue, you know, widely discussed in the West. And, and it's, it's, of course it's presented as knowledge and wisdom from the West, as in the introduction. But the thing is that I think it's very, I mean, the, the, the purpose is very simple. It's, it's uh, he's addressing the Chinese literati. The one, they, they, they have the power to decide if they stay or not. It failed. It was a clumsy attempt, it's the second work. And it's, it's um, between two very successful writings which is the treatise on friendship, no, 
and a catechism, the Tian Chu Shui, which is there you have metaphysics in that catechism. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's Aristotle. It's that the four causes translating to Chinese. It's a very appealing work. So I mean, this this one fell into oblivion. But I think that we should see it as trial and error. Mm -hmm. See what works or not. And he was impressed by the, the Chinese characters themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that what Richie is, is like he never mentioned this piece again, and everybody forgot it. And there were no later editions. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that this is a uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this project, but I don't work only on China. I also work on, on Spanish the missions in Spanish America. What I do is try to analyze the circulation of the art of memory in colonial spaces and mission spaces and non-colonial mission spaces. So what you see is that actually it's, it's, a, it's a paradox that this is a non-colonial mission space and he's trying to impose you know, a Western method. When actually in other mission spaces, they would see that the local techniques were more useful for the Indians, maybe in Peru, to remember doctrine, and they would allow the Indians to use these, I mean, their methods, even if the Jesuits did not understand how they worked. Mm -hmm. So what, this, what I'm saying is this is a part of, of a very bigger and more ambitious project of how you see the art of memory, to use a very vague category, was circulating throughout the mission spaces and what you see is this kind of, of this kind of attempt, they could work or not, they could be cuts or not, of, of exporting or appropriating or different attitudes to what you know was there and actually which is ignoring local techniques. I haven't found not even one comment about diagrams or actually memorization. Like so the, the Chinese were, I mean they would repeat, you know, the passages of, of, of the different classics once and again. And could I ask Claire uh, uh, um, just a question that uh, um, kind of comes out of what you've just been saying, which is how successful, I mean, we're talking about failure here, yeah. <laughs> how successful do you think this uh, very kind of machine-like, it almost feels like, uh, uh, kind of staged translation and very um, very rigid kind of sense that it has to be from the Latin and it's uh, very systematized. I mean, do we have any, do you have any kind of way of grasping the success of this um, in within the, the Russian state. Well, interestingly, what I found in 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 the cases where we do have a known resolution, in that the Russian court, having paid enormous amounts of money to recruit these men and bring them over and have them compose things and have people translate them, is that they then completely ignore what they say. <laughs> um, so when almost every time when they're asked to report on the plague, they say it's absolutely not the plague. Um, the Moscowites then quarantine everyone involved anyway, including their very well-paid Western physicians that they've paid to bring across from the, the, these foreign courts. Um, the Western physicians tell them on a couple of occasions, do not buy this unicorn horn, this is simply nonsense, we, we don't believe that this is the case, and the Russians ignore them and spend the equivalent of a yearly budget on a couple of different unicorn horns um, brought in from Amsterdam. And so it's, it's interesting that they, see, they spend a lot of time and money getting the knowledge but then they do whatever the hell they feel like anyway. And so the, the story that seems to be coming out of, 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 of these texts, for me, is that the Russians want to know what these people think, mm -hmm. but are perfectly happy to ignore them if they don't feel that it applies. And also something that maybe does link your papers together about this question about, if you like, the symbolic nature of the knowledge, not the actual content of it, but the fact that it's, as it were, there. Uh, yeah, which uh, you know, uh, which is um, part of it's wanting to know about it. Partly is we we, we are opening the door to the West. We we you know just that really, and you have to perfunctorily almost go through that, and th which is why it might be partly to do with it being so concise, you know, shortened to its minimum. Yeah, I think we should stop <laughs> um, because uh, I'm afraid. Unless sorry, I should ask if any. I mean, I don't, I think it occurred to me that I didn't want to keep. Everybody's sitting there, and I was talking all the time. Um, so, if anyone else has any questions, uh, you know, any other questions, burning questions? I've yeah. got a mental yeah. question. Yeah. Well, what's the word um, used for image? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And does he use which word? Is and no. 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 Not, not at all. Not to, to no. No. Yes. No, yeah. not at all. Not in the whole. No. Which character? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that one, yeah, okay, right.
So he, he doesn't use the, the standard term for an image used to... Yeah. So no, 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 it's a literal, it's a literal mm -hmm. word. Thank you very much. And, uh, could we thank our speakers again? It's very interesting.